share the adventures of our early pioneers as we explore the development of the Pacific Northwest and beyond with your host, Mike Roberts, and historian, Bill Barley. Welcome to Gold Trails and Ghost Towns. Mike Roberts is my name with Bill Barley, our resident historian, uh, host, storyteller. And today, you know, we've done this once before. We've, we've forsaken gold and silver, and we're going to do that again today. We're going to talk about the Pittsburgh of the North. Now, the Pittsburgh of the North is, I think, probably the greatest coal town in British Columbia, Fernie's. And in the, Fernie's, in the Rockies. Yeah, Fernie's right in the Rockies, and it's the, I think it's the jewel, kind of the undiscovered jewel of the Rockies. Now, Fernie has been there almost a century, Mike. It's still there, amazingly, and it was a distribution point for the whole area of that crow's nest half country. Okay, so we're heading to Fernie in the Rockies, and we're talking about coal today. Back in just a moment with more. <laughs> Sounds only today, it's coal seams, I suppose. Fernie, yeah. named after a guy named Fernie, I would bet. Yeah, interesting character, Mike. He was, um, he was a prospector, he was a wanderer with his brother, Peter, and he first tried Australia. Great gold fields in Australia. William Fernie and his brother didn't hit anything. <laughs> oh. So they transferred. New Zealand, good gold fields in the north part of New Zealand. After gold again, again, no luck. So he said, okay, gold rush in, in Canada. So he went to Revelstoke, looked for gold there, again, nothing. turned up nothing. Transferred to Caribou. Had to find gold there. You mean gold was so. common as salt and pepper there. Not for William Fernie. Nothing in Caribou. Then he went down to the wild horse country, worked in the wild horse around 1864, nothing there. And then he became foreman on the extension of the Dudeney Trail. Sort of gave up on this search for gold, did he? That's right. Okay, wise move, finally. But he stayed in that Kootenai country. Something attracted him you know, to that particular country. Marvelous part of the province, of course, anyway. And he became, uh, actually, a mining recorder and government agent from 1876 to 1882. So that was a good paying job. But, you know, the prospecting bug, it bites once and there's no known cure. So, quit the job, good job, prospected for five years. Came across little seams of coal here and there, nothing to his liking. Finally, he and his brother came across a magnificent seam of high-grade coal just off uh, a little creek, Michelle Creek, in that in near Fernie today. And this was the beginning. Then they began prospecting very seriously. He's 50 years old now, Mike. Yeah. And he prospecting very seriously, staked a bunch of other ground, and formed what is called the Crow's Nest Pass Coal Company, which and was the grandfather of all the huge coal operations in that East Kootenai country. And how many communities eventually did we come up with that, with, that established with coal as their base? I'll mention some. Okay. Morrissey Creek which is just, just, uh, just outside of Fernie. Then there's Coal Creek. Then there's Hosmer. Then there's Natal. Then there's Michelle. Then there's Corbin. So and those are the major towns. The small coal towns, far different than Fernie. The coal towns had miners, you know, that were, yeah. that were, came from all sorts of different backgrounds. There were Italians, there were Yugoslavs, there were Englishmen, you know, who'd mined in England. This, uh, this there were shot, Americans. for example, I mean, when you take a look at the faces, in yeah. this picture, uh, maybe the guy in the middle, he looks maybe like he could be green, right? I mean, he, yeah, doesn't, he, could be. he doesn't look as gnarly as the others. But, but he's carrying a safety lamp. Well, they're all carrying that. I yeah. mean, that's the, what you had to have, because yeah. coal was uh, coal dust. and This uh, is very, very what we call bumpy country. Very dangerous country for the Crow's Nest Pass. We'll discuss this in a future program on other towns. But it was some of the most dangerous country in, in, uh, for yeah. coal miners in, in Canada. No doubt about it at all. And they would go into the mine, and this looks like a pretty, you know, those little coal, the little gold mines had little such narrow openings right. at the beginning. But look, this has got this big horse in the middle sure. of it, and they would, yeah. they, horses would do the trucking, I would take yeah, it. Yeah, indeed they did. They pulled the coal cars out of the, at least in those early years, pulled the coal cars right out of the depths of the mine. Yeah. So, so what happened, of course, is what, Fernie becomes the headquarters. There are a bunch of little coal towns scattered all over the place. Yeah. And this is, this, is, uh, this is an era when coal is king. So the 1890s you're looking at, early 1900s. All of the navies are still firing their uh, sh ships on coal, all sure of the uh, smelting the and railroad, and all of this. Uh, railroads, the steel makers, the, the, the ships at sea, all of them are using coal. So this is, a, this is a godsend. This is a real find. And what happens, of course, is that Fernie becomes the distribution center. It doesn't become an actual mining town. The headquarters of the Crow's Nest Pass Coal Company is in Fernie, where it should be. All the offices of the company are there. 
William Fernie is a very wealthy man by now, mm -hmm. an extremely wealthy man. He does exceptionally well on his find, which he didn't do in, in gold, he makes it in coal. And there are mansions built in Fernie, but the, you know, it's funny about Fernie. Fernie's gone through some, some highs and lows. This was a high time between, well, Fernie became, they began to plot the, the town site in about 1898, and they, and they had lots and streets and so on. Became a city in 1904, Mike. Yeah has a population of about 4,500 people, over 4,000 people. Now, this shot here shows it, for example. There's a great big train station right in the middle. Oh, yeah. We see uh, all sorts of buildings and towns and, yeah. uh, and hotels and banks. And I mean, this is a real place. And, oh. and it must be scenic as can be with the mountains all around. Oh, no. Fernie is, is spectacular. I mean, well, you know, I, I could go on and on about Fernie. I'm extremely fond of Fernie. You pass right by it today, Mike on Highway 3, which is called the Crow's Nest Pass Highway. But you pass right by Fernie, but you have to get off that highway about half a mile and go right into Old Fernie, because it is almost, well, it's the same as it has been for 75 years. Yeah. It's a marvelous town. And, and uh, you know, I, and there were all, at that time, there were all sorts of hotels. There was the Fernie, and there was the Alberta, and there was the Napanee, and there was the King, and there was the Royal, and, and look at there that was the Waldorf. And look goes on forever. Oh, that sure, it does. Goes on it shows two of the hotels right there. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Kings, and, and then the Napanee right yep. next to it. But the other thing about this, there's two interesting things about that photo, Mike. One is wooden boardwalk, which is interesting. You were always a fan of wooden boardwalk. Oh, you bet I am. You, you were, as a I kid, am. always scalping coins from underneath. You bet it was. All over the Kootenai country and all over the Boundary country, no doubt about it, and in the Okanagan too, to a degree, and in the Smilkameen. And the other thing was, is that virtually every building on that avenue, which is Victoria Avenue, which was a show place. I mean, you go down the other coal towns, those little towns like Corbin and Morrissey and, and Coal Creek and Hogman, nothing like Fernie. Fernie, you were going to the city. And they were all wooden buildings. Yeah. Now, foreshadowing, they should have known but they were so busy building, so busy cashing in on their good fortune, they didn't bother to build a brick and stone. And there were a couple of rather serious fires that burned a block here and burned a block there. But on August the 1st, actually in August of 1908, one of the hottest years on record, Mike, on the, the forests around Fernie were tinder dry. The creeks were low. And a little fire started in a little lumber, lumber camp, actually a little milling operation just uh, west of Fernie, and it got out of control. And it was so dry that it started leapfrogging. And it was then accompanied by a high wind, heading straight for Fernie. It continued to head straight for Fernie, swept into Fernie. And ordinarily in these towns, Mike, you have time to blow up a couple of buildings in advance of a fire. This fire was coming at such a high rate of speed, the buildings were literally exploding in its path. In some instances, in one place it skipped half a block. It went right, nobody can, those people were saved. 25 people perished in this fire at least. And people were running ahead of the fire, and the fire was catching up. 25 people did not make it. Yeah. Remember that beautiful shot of uh, Victoria Avenue? This is of that same town oh. just a few days later. It shows, the, shows the telephone pole. It, it survived, and there's one building in the midst of this. This looks like Hiroshima photograph. It's you know? it, it, just incredible. The whole town, Mike, virtually was devastated. People thought that Fernie would never recover. There were over 4,000 people. There was no place for them to go. There was no, virtually no food in town. Four bridges had been burned. It was gone. It was gone. It was, it was devastating. Well, I mean, look, at here's the, here, what you said they didn't build a stone and brick. Well, here's well, the Bank did. of Commerce. Yeah, the Bank of Commerce decided to play it very, very carefully. <laughs> build of stone, look what happened to the Bank of Commerce. Nothing. Virtually nothing. And the federal government used foresight for once, and this time they build a stone. That's the first post office. That's the post office. It's gone. Gone. Now, look at this. Uh, there's a huge sort of mass of something here. What is, uh, what is that thing well, that's what, sitting on what the Well, what this is, Mike, what happened? They had everything in Fernie. They had a dozen hotels. They had banks. They had, uh, they had post offices. They had government buildings. They even had an opera house. The fire hit that opera house. It hit it so hard, it lifted the metal, the metal roof right off the opera house and blew it for a block before it landed. Crash blew it for a block. And, of course, each one of these flaming projectiles people, would start fires sure, further down the way. People couldn't believe it. People who had lived through that fire simply could not believe it. Here's a shot of uh, some of the coal cars, and look at, they are just twisted masses. I guess any coal that would in it 
would have begun to burning at a tremendous degree, and it melted the uh, the metal coal cars. Well, I mean, you know, the, the metal these coal cars are made out of steel. Yeah. And they're good steel. CPR didn't waste time. They put good steel in their in their coal cars. Yeah. And those they're literally charred. They're they're bent. Yeah. They're turned. Now you said that there was nothing. I mean, these people were helpless. This shot right here shows obviously new buildings. Some sawmill whipped up some buildings, yeah. and these people are obviously coming to some sort of aid station. Parts of the town, on, the, on one part of the town, was not hit that hard. They're going there to receive food, relief. And relief came, from, came in from all over. This was, this was actually made headlines all across Canada, yeah. the Great Fernie Fire. This is also a great shot, too, because when, you know, when I think of some of these early towns and these mining towns, I yeah. think of them being filled with just men. But here's a lady oh, and her yeah. baby and uh, quite a few women and... Uh, these are families. This is the kind of thing that travel with with coal mines. W well, yeah, but this this travels with a distribution center. You wouldn't oh, find as right. many wouldn't find as many women out in the small coal towns surrounding Fernie. Yeah. But in Fernie itself, there'd be lots of business business people there, and so they'd bring their families. There'd be railroad people there, Crossmeadows Pass Coal Company, and so on. So they all had their families. What a disaster! Oh, like yeah. forty five hundred people suddenly, yeah. most of them without any home. Most of them without anything at all. And remember, everything went. Yeah. Every, they didn't even have time to gather up their precious possessions. Uh, you know, if they had if they had rings in, in, in the jewel box and they had and they had gold coins, they didn't even have time. They had to head out that door immediately. And run I mean, as this fast was, as they could some go. of these people made it by thirty seconds and forty five seconds from from you know from being incinerated by this fire. I mean, it was just, it was just that close. Unbelievable. Yeah. Now everybody thought it was going to die, but we've got some additional pictures that show. Yeah that uh, getting back, this almost reminds me of uh, Kelowna and the, uh, all the business about the hot dog stands, because here's a guy with a wagon, and he's selling sure. something out of the wagon. That's right the here. first portable restaurant, and probably uh, <laughs> within a week after the fire, and uh, this guy is an entrepreneur, and he decides to cash in that's on it. Dark that's Dark Angelo's. It says Dark Angelo's yeah, on yeah, there. Yeah, that's There's uh, one of the names. It's Frail Family, too. Yeah, and look, at here's a guy who set up his butcher shop, yeah. using uh, uh, one of the remaining telephone poles to hang the beef on. Sure, and not only that, he's distributing meat. He is probably paid either by the CPR or the coal company to distribute, uh, yeah. to distribute meat to the, to the various people who survived the fire. There is that funny building with that hip roof in the back yeah. that managed to survive. Did yeah. anybody figure it was some sort of blessed location? I, I think, I think the, the, uh, it probably had a slate roof, yeah. so that may have saved it. Yeah. And then here is a shot in, uh, obviously, with snow coming down the hills, we presume this is the winter, the late fall of 1908, sure. and quite a few new clapboard buildings going up. Yeah, you, you can see, even in some of the other pictures, you can see they were taken a couple of days after the fire, and you can see tents in the background, and you can see new buildings starting yeah. to come up. And what happened, of course, Mike, was that, that I think people outside of Fernie felt that Fernie would never recover, would never, reco you know, would never come from the ashes. And, but the people in Fernie didn't believe that at all. They knew that they were... They were the distribution point. That they knew they were the natural capital of the East Kootenai country, and the building began almost immediately. And so Victoria Avenue became the main thoroughfare again. But a changed Victoria Avenue. This is a Victoria Avenue covered with brick buildings and stone buildings. And when you go into when you go into Fernie today, Mike, you see a really quite a magnificent town. You see a town three quarters of a century old, in some parts older than that but the majority of it is, is, is from 1908. And it is really quite unique. It has the, the echoes from the 1890s and the turn of the century. And uh, some of the old hotels are still there. Some of the mansions that were there when Fernie was, was young are still there. Some of those were saved. Mm -hmm. And it, it has a special atmosphere. I, I feel that, um, that Fernie is one of those few towns in the province that really has that, that ambience. Of, of, of an old, old town. You could almost hear the stagecoaches coming down the street. You could almost see the wooden boardwalks. They're not there now, of course. But Fernie is that type of town. Now, and again, there are so many cultural groups, because I imagine a lot of Lancashire men yeah. or Britishers would come over because they knew the coal business. Yeah. They'd be there. Uh, so many uh, uh, Czechoslovakian, Italian, yeah. all these people oh, would come large, in. There. Large uh, Czechoslovakian and Yugoslavian uh, community in that area. Very large Italian community, somewhat similar to Trail and the old Gulfstream Trail, the enclave of the Italians in that town. And many of the families are still there. The original Italian families who, who came there at the turn of the century, yeah. their, their, their descendants are still in Fernie. Yeah. And of course, many old people like the Quayle family, and so they've been there since uh, Bill Quayle gave me a lot of background on Fernie. 
I noticed the name attached to all of these photographs is Spalding. Yeah. Uh, I mean, was he one of the uh, one of the well-known photographers, or, or did he just happen to be the man in the place? I'm trying to remember whether Spalding came from from Fernie or came from Calgary, and I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, I can't tell you that. And there was nothing on to uh, to confirm that or deny that on the on the back of the photographs at all, Mike. So, but he might have been just a cover in the news yeah. at the time and coming yeah. into town. Okay, so Fernie disappears, but uh, through its own sheer enthusiasm for itself yeah. comes back and there's a couple of interesting stories to tell which we'll do right after this break about uh, both about Fernie and about some of the outlying communities. We'll do that in just a minute. Ghost Towns, we're in Fernie today, talking about that fine distribution center in the midst of the coal district of southeastern British Columbia. And there's a few other characters. I mean, we mentioned Bill Fernie after whom, William, sorry, William Fernie, after whom the town is named, yep. and Mr. Quayle, who you've had some dealings with. Yep. But there's another fellow who I've heard of name as Mr. Pick. Yeah. Tell me about Mr. Pick. Well, Mr. Pick was I th probably the most colorful citizen of Fernie now. Robert Thornton Lowry was there, the great newspaper editor, but but Pick was there for quite a long time. He was sort of grassroots, Italian community, Pick area, head yeah. of the, sort of the neighborhood. Yeah, he was indeed. Came as, a, came as a small businessman. And when Prohibition came into Alberta about 1917, uh, he saw a chance to uh, enhance his, uh, his business uh, activities. BC was not as eagerly into Prohibition. Mm -hmm. BC so. had a much more lax uh, Prohibition. Than, uh, than Alberta did, but there was a great demand for the product. So whether it was whiskey or mostly whiskey, um, he decided to get into the act. And I have, um, I have a lot of sympathy for Mr. Pick, uh, or Mr. Pick as people called him. He was an expansive guy. He was five feet, 10 inches tall, weighed over 200 pounds. Yeah. Um, Put on a snazzy dresser. Yeah, very snazzy dresser. In some, some instances he was. Uh, he was very well liked, both in the Italian community and outside of the Italian community. He was not a violent man. Um, his activities essentially did not hurt anybody at that particular time, although, very interestingly, they resulted in the deaths of five people. And uh, that was a, a kind of an abortive robbery attempt when he was on a train, supposedly carrying $10,000, which I believe he was. He carried a lot of cash with him, ten or $20,000. When you're looking at 1917 or 18, Mike, Ooh. that's a lot of money. Multiply that by 40, and you're looking at 400,000 to uh, <laughs> to 800,000 dollars. So three individuals got on the train, held up the train, looking for Mr. Pick. He was not well dressed that time. As they came down the car, emptying everyone's wallet, hoping to find Mr. Pick, he shifted seats and left the wad of cash on the empty seat across the aisle, tucked in behind the seat. All he had was a little bit of cash in his pocket, evidently. They came down, didn't recognize him, took the cash out of his pocket, left the train in a hurry after threatening everybody, and uh, took about $400 and split when they got outside. Two of them went one way and one went another way. One went across the line. One stayed in the general area. Uh, at least two stayed in the general area. And eventually they were cornered and there was a shootout. One of the policemen was killed. One of these individuals was killed. Uh, in, the, in the ensuing manhunt, one escaped. Another policeman accidentally shot and killed another policeman. This guy was, ha was hanged, the, the second survivor of the, of the gang. And the third one was eventually brought back for trial into Canada and died in prison. So Mr. Pick, in this case, was an innocent victim of other hoodlums. Yes, but was uh, inadvertently the cause of five deaths, probably. Just because and he was he an And uh, he would have regretted that. Uh, he was really quite a fascinating guy. And, um, and he was kind of the Robin Hood of the area. When families were down on their luck, he would distribute uh, significant amounts of cash and other goods at Christmas time to make sure they could tide themselves over. So, um, uh, you know, I haven't a lot of sympathy for, for rum runners or bootleggers, but uh, if ever, ever I did have sympathy, uh, I think Mr. Pick would be at the top of my list. So many colorful characters in these mining yeah. towns, and so many, as we've already alluded sure. to, so many different nationalities. Yeah. There. Now, you alluded in the fire story to yeah. about uh, the fact that people weren't even able to uh, save any of their precious belongings. Did they go through the wreckage and sift for it and try and find it, or what happened to all the wealth of Fernie after the fire? I think most people uh, 
anticipate that gold and silver is going to burn up in a fire because the fire is so, so incredibly hot. That doesn't happen. Gold is virtually untouched in a fire unless it well, stays at well over 3,000 degrees for a, a, a considerable length of time. Silver may be bent, yeah. but, but gold, you know, pulls through a fire almost intact. So that I think that, uh, like most of the mining towns, usually they took the, they used a scraper, they, they loaded the, scra the, the, the debt reef from the scraper in a wagon, they then took the wagon to the dump. And so that's where all the precious belongings that's are. That's where the sterling silver, silver would be, the gold coins, uh, the gold rings, because people fled so fast, as I mentioned before, yes. they couldn't pick up their valuables. Now, there might be another place in this area where there is gold in the ground, and it wasn't put there because it was just dumped. Tell me about the, the people of Corbin. Well, you know, I went back there in 1968, Mike, on the advice of some old-timers in mm -hmm. Fernie. They said, Bill, they said, Corbin has a story to tell. Well, first you have to take a quick look at Corbin. Corbin had 600 people. They had a terrific showing of, of, of coal ore there that was magnificent. They called it the big showing. And uh, they mined that for years until the Great Strike of 1935. There were people from Yugoslavia and other parts of Europe who did not trust the banks. And some of the old-timers who were in Corbin said, Bill, they didn't use the banks. They buried their gold and silver coins in the ground around their shacks in Corbin. Here are some pictures of yeah. Corbin that I took in 1968. Those are gone now. The, the old tipple was in the, the last state of disrepair right then. This is where the coal comes to the tipple. Then it's loaded and, and, it's, and, and it's out of the town. So coal would, what, come down in some sort of an aerial tramway yeah, to that often. spot and yeah. then be dumped out? Yeah. And here's some old uh, buildings. These are prospectors' houses. So Those are miners' the, cabins. Uh, miners' cabins. Yeah. Up on that hillside, yeah. they might have dug a couple of pits and yeah. dropped a little gold down there. Undoubtedly. There were hundreds and hundreds of people in Corbin for decades. And so there was lots around. But the unfortunate part, I went back in there a few years later, and they'd come back to mine the big showing again. So I don't think there's much left. It probably went with the coal. Or it's where the overburden went. And I guess, I mean, these towns would be uh, pretty fragile. I mean, there are not a lot of foundations for buildings yeah. like that. So... Yeah evidence is wiped out. Yeah, Corbin's gone. Great place to go back to. I went through Fernie, I guess, about three years ago now, had lunch in a great restaurant cafe, and, uh, and such a wonderful spot uh, that it's worth a trip back there right now. So head back to Fernie. I don't know whether they'd appreciate you poking around their dump, but have a good time in Fernie and enjoy the, the atmosphere and the ambience of the place. Bill, thank you very much. You're very welcome, Mike. Bill Barley, our historian, storyteller, Iraq on tour, and that's it for Fernie today. But be back with us next time as we continue to take.